Well, speaking then of uh, professionalism and the professional theater, first of all, let's uh, take up the um, uh, overlap between uh, uh, the sort of developing professional theater community and uh, participation in the Earl Grey Players. By the uh, late 1940s, early 1950s, um, television was uh, uh, being uh, gradually phased in. It was finally, it finally began in September 1952. The um, uh, CBC as we know it had been established in two, the two networks, the uh, Trans-Canada Network and the Dominion Network by mm -hmm. 1936. And Toronto was by the middle 40s, I think, a, um, uh, the center of a, of a fairly thriving industry. Um, with uh, a large number of people gaining, st uh, uh, holding steady employment in radio and then after 1952 uh, in television. Did, um, uh, did the development of um, uh, a, uh, uh, a theater uh, community that had uh, ready access to employment in radio and television uh, affect the availability of good people for the uh, Earl Grey Festival? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he got um, some people from that. So John Draney is an example. Mm -hmm. um, Lauren Green was another one. Um, and uh, but a lot of the the uh, actors that he got were um, off the ship from from England. They they they're, they're actors who came to Canada and they were looking for employment and he employed them so that uh, the, the plays had a pronounced English accent to them uh, which I, f I found rather interesting because uh, uh, Father never told uh, actors to adopt a particular accent. I mean he might have said to the Canadian actors adopt a, an English accent please. Never said that. They spoke as they wanted to speak, so so the the plays had an unevenness of accents. Uh, uh, oh. There were some uh, uh, some would speak with <laughs> with a very plummy accent, and others would speak with uh, you know a pretty uh, broad Canadian accent. I spoke with the latter, although I tried to I tried to soften uh, my speech. So uh, I didn't get it to the so-called mid-Atlantic accent, but uh, I, I I got it l less sharp than I'm speaking right now, for instance. Uh, the Stratford Festival uh, started in 1953, and you were saying earlier that by that time the um, uh, Earl Grey Shakespearean Festival, which had grown from those two or three performances in the Quadrangle at Trinity in 1946 mm -hmm. to a, a four-week uh, mm -hmm. affair, and by 1955, I think, even a five-week yep. affair there in um, uh, the Trinity College Quadrangle, uh, that uh, audiences had nevertheless already begun to decline by about uh, the early 1950s, by 1951 or 1952. Uh, yeah, they, they would have um, declined maybe one or two years before Stratford. Uh, the decline was not precipitous, but there was a, a noticeable decline in the number of people that came. And it was, I think, uh, we, we all said that it was, whether it's right or not, but that we all believed it was attributable to um, the advent of, of uh, musicals in the tent. Uh, an, another organization um, had musicals, uh, popular musicals, and they had a tent. And I, I believe the tent was was in that field uh, north of um, the quadrangle. In the field, right between the uh, Trinity that's Quadrangle my, and the Barclay Stadium. That's my recollection. I, I wouldn't swear to it. But, but I know the musicals existed, and they were in a tent, and they did drain off some of our audience we felt. Not, not uh, to a huge extent, but to a noticeable one. What do you remember of the response in your parents' household to the creation of the Stratford Festival? First of all, um, did, uh, um, did your parents expect to be invited to participate in it? Did they expect to be? Mm -hmm. no. no. I wouldn't have thought so. No. No. Why not? Uh, um, um, Tyrone Guthrie was, I believe, a colleague of your father's from Oxford he was. University of Dramatics. He was, Society. and I think I think father saw him too at, uh, um, in in Canada. Mm -hmm. They've had a meeting, but no, they, they um, well, the reaction was first of all uh, they didn't like it, 
uh, because they did see it as some sort of a competition. Okay. Um, they felt that um, they could survive notwithstanding the advent of, of Stratford. I, I think they may have um, felt that um, the consciousness of the Canadian people had, uh, towards Shakespeare had risen uh, to, a, uh, to a level where, where both could exist side by side without uh, being real competitors. I think that was naive, but uh, I understand that that was their, their view. And in fact, um, there was some truth in that because uh, there's no doubt that, that people, <coughs> there were more people in Toronto, at least, uh, that uh, had seen Shakespeare and liked what they saw by the end of the festival than at the beginning. I mean, with the, there was a real evolutionary process here that, that uh, uh, there was no Shakespeare except once or two, uh, one or two performances at the Royal Alec would come and go. But it's fe effectively, there was no Shakespeare performed until the, uh, you know, the Earl Grey players came along. And that did build, it built an audience, but it had had a, um, a ripple effect well beyond the, the audience to, to people that may never have seen the plays. So there was a consciousness about, uh, of, of Shakespeare as, as a, uh, a worthy event uh, that people would like to see. And, and that consciousness, I think, um, uh, created an atmosphere that uh, allowed uh, Tom Patterson to raise the money and, and um, uh, start the Stratford Festival. Uh, I don't think it's an exaggeration to, to conclude that if the uh, Earl Grey Shakespeare Festival weren't there, it's problematical whether Stratford would have started, at least at that time, it may have eventually started, but, but I, I don't think it would have started necessarily at that time. There well, was a, a consciousness raising. Now, now there's an awareness of that. that um, my parents realized that more people liked Shakespeare at the time that Stratford came along, and that allowed them to draw that conclusion that there was, there was room for both. In fact, as it turned out, there wasn't. Well, of course, it was uh, particularly um, uh, likely that, uh, or, uh, that the Earl Grey Festival had a, an influence on the development of the Stratford Festival, given that Tom Patterson was himself an undergraduate yeah. at Trinity College during, yeah. the, uh, during the years when yeah. the Earl Grey Festival first, uh, first started. Yeah. Yeah. By uh, the early 1950s, the festival had developed, as we were saying, into a, um, uh, an affair lasting up to uh, five or even six weeks. There was a mm. summer drama school affiliated mm. with the festival and a uh, touring company that I think was uh, consisted largely of the same personnel, um, performance personnel yes. as performed the summer festival yeah. that went to the schools um, uh, through a pretty full through a pretty full schedule, usually right yeah, and, through the and fall. and musical concerts on Sundays during the festival. Yeah, right. So that um, so that by the early 1950s, the Royal Grey Shakespearean Festival had developed into a um, uh, pretty multifaceted mm. um, affair and one that uh, were touched on Toronto's cultural life at a number of different points, mm. not yes. just Shakespeare, yeah. um, but also music and yeah. uh, and also uh, yeah. very much education. Uh, I'd like to uh, get you to share us uh, any reminiscences uh, you may have of uh, Provost Seeley. Yeah. And uh, uh, the, um, uh, the relationship between him and your father, because of course that was, uh, I think, probably one of the central um, uh, relationships um, mm -hmm. on, which the, uh, on which the existence of the festival was based. Mm -hmm. Um, what do you recall? Well, I recall uh, meeting Seeley um, a few times. Um, I didn't know him like my father did. Uh, uh, he was um, he was a very um, uh, haughty individual. Oh, okay. uh, and um, very self confident. Um, uh, uh, I think a highly cultivated man, and uh, one interested in the arts, uh, which um, I think we. We, we talked a little bit about that aspect at home. And, and he's a religious man, he was a religious figure, and uh, it wasn't considered that usual that senior religious figures would have much interest in, in the arts, mm -hmm. um, individuals aside, but this one did. And um, saw immediately how having Shakespeare performed in the, in the quadrangle would enhance somehow the, uh, the reputation of the, of the, of the college 
and and provide a service to to the public. I, I think he could see he could see the social value in introducing Shakespeare to Canadians. You know, Seeley was English, um, mm -hmm. and um, he would have been. I suppose one of the, these people that I were talking about that the Canadians may not have related that well to because he was highly cultivated, very well educated, and he was highly intelligent, and he was uh, extremely self-confident uh, and on the haughty side. But, uh, but uh, uh, in a way, I, I wondered why or how my father was able to get along with him so well because the father was completely different. He was a very modest man. Uh, he was highly cultivated and intelligent and all of that, but but um, he was not outgoing. He was quite an introvert. Uh, he was quite shy and um, uh, uh, you know self-deprecating. And uh, he is not an academic at all. He left school at an early age to join the Abbey Theatre, uh, so he didn't have an academic background. Although he was interested in history, he read quite a bit. He seemed to. Uh, to follow uh, cultural pursuits outside of, uh, of the drama a little bit. But, and so he could talk to somebody like, like Seeley, but he was not of the same background. He was not a religious man either. He didn't have any religion virtually. Uh, Seeley did. So there didn't seem to be a natural fit between the two men, but, but there was, in fact, um, um, a, a very close cooperation. Uh, Seeley really did support uh, what um, my parents were doing there. And of course, when he died, it all began to unravel. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, um, on the uh, other hand, um, whereas uh, your father was um, very lucky, I think, in forming alliances like the one uh, with Provost Seely, uh with the, um, what we might call the, the uh, uh, figurehead uh, um, elite um, in, uh, in education, uh, there was uh, a great deal of discord with the sort of de facto authorities uh, on city council, mm. uh, which I think um, your mother was mostly involved in. Yeah. What are your um, uh, What are your memories of your mother's, uh, your parents' dealings, and particularly your mother's dealings with uh, Toronto Council? Uh, well. Uh, I mean, she was very uh, uh, upset that that they never seemed to support the the festival. And I, I, now, this was in spite of the fact, incidentally, that your parents uh, declined or did not seek, or uh, and uh, on one or two occasions even declined offers of financial support from various government facilities until 1957, yeah. when the foundation was established. Is that correct? Well, sort of. I I don't know if they actually declined anything. Um, okay, they just didn't actively seek. Uh, perhaps it, it's important to to realize that that they were not commercial people at all. I mean, they were just art, artistic people, and um, and and that offers a, com a complete comparison or contrast with with Stratford. I mean, Tom Patterson was a, a clever commercial guy. He mm -hmm. was good at raising money and and getting people to cooperate, and he was an entrepreneur in a commercial sense. My parents were entrepreneurs in an artistic sense. They had no feeling for money, uh, although they were extremely careful and, and frugal. They didn't spend a, a dime, but, but they, didn't, uh, they didn't have much of a business sense in the normal sense of the word. Uh, so they, they didn't feel comfortable asking for money. And they were always worried that if uh, too much money came in, they would lose control over the enterprise, that they'd be bossed around by the money men. So there was that uh, reluctance. In it. They were hoping that the, that the, um, the ticket sales would, be, would, would give them enough money to, to carry on, and, and they did um, in their fashion. Uh, now, when it comes to the municipal uh, people, I don't know uh, enough about the details of the relationship between my mother and them, but but uh, mother was was very outgoing, very outspoken, and uh, very pushy, and she got things done. But she upset people often in the process. She could alienate you. Uh, if, if she was dead set against smoking, for instance. I've I've seen her stop uh, somebody in the in the street who was smoking and and give them a lecture about not smoking. <laughs> <laughs> She was that way, <laughs> and uh, if you disagreed with her, 
boy, she'd run over you like a train. <laughs> and uh, in doing so, she would put people off. I, I, I don't know whether she personally put people off at, at the municipal level or not. I, I, I really don't know, but I wouldn't be surprised if, if she did.